New York Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert last night talking about, among other things, the crisis in Gaza. Let's take a listen. I think, first of all, it's important. We need to acknowledge, actually, the, the upside of the uncommitted movement, which is that these are folks that could have easily given way to cynicism and walked away from this process entirely. And what they're doing instead is using the primary to send a message and say, this is important to me, to the president. This is important to me. I'm going to engage in our democratic process. I am gonna show up. I am gonna vote. I am gonna say what's important to me. But I also know, and I do believe that many in the uncommitted campaign believe this, I also know the, and understand the threat of a Donald Trump presidency. All right. Well, I really appreciated her defense of the uncommitted movement. There is a way that whenever uncommitted comes up, especially in more liberal circles, it's unclear whether or not you're going to get a kind of warm embrace. Yes, they're trying to push Biden in the right direction in order to so he can win more votes and so they can actually beat Biden. This is an issue that he's struggling with, et cetera. Or the more common response, which is a little bit of a saltier one, which is seeing the uncommitted movement as an opposition movement that is intended to basically boost Trump to hurt Biden. And I think that kind of mentality comes from a presumption that Biden cannot be moved. So drawing more attention to the ways that he's displeasing his base is a lose-lose scenario. So I, this is a delicate, a delicate dance for AOC to do here in this moment, and I think she acquitted herself pretty well, focusing on the idea that this is a primary, this is not a general election, that primaries are an opportunity for voters to send a message, and it's frankly incumbent on the incumbent to decide to listen or not. Yeah, I think what's going to be interesting is when it's no longer a primary and when it moves to a general election, if there are elements, as there probably will be, of the uncommitted movement saying that, sorry, Biden has failed us on this or any number of other issues, and we're going to either stay home or, you know, Jill Stein's in the race or Cornell West or whoever, and, uh, and sorry, because Biden has not triangulated on this issue whatsoever or to our satisfaction, that's what we're going to do. Then what are the AOCs of the world going to say? Yeah, I've been personally sort of conflicted about this because I have, you know, full disclosure, been arguing that the left should take this kind of a position for a long time. Really establish what their litmus test is, what their demands are far in advance of an election. And to say, it is your opportunity to get these votes or not. Here are voters that we have identified, voters that we have registered, voters that we are pulling into the game that weren't even in the game before, and that will vote for you if you satisfy these conditions. And be very, very loud and public about that fact to do as much media as you can so that if it becomes the case that the candidate, the, the Democratic candidate ultimately decides to ignore that advice, they can no longer turn around after Election Day if they lose and blame progressives for not falling in line. And this only works, by the way, if you're talking about policies that have broad public approval. I completely agree that there are things that I care about and that I like that don't have broad public ap approval. And that if I said, oh, you got to vote to give Brown and Dre Gray a free house and I'm not going to vote for you unless you do do that, obviously I'm not going to get the public on my side on that. But on issues like Medicare for all, on issues like um, a minimum wage, on issues like ending the siege in Gaza, it really is not just saying this is my personal political peccadillo. It's saying this is literally in your best interest, Biden, if you want to constitute that big coalition that uh, AOC alluded to, to actually listen to what they're saying. And this is formalizing the demand in the form of an uncommitted vote. Yeah, well, they're kind of they're listening to what, well, I don't know. They're watching the uncommitted vote, right? right? And they're watching it with distrust, suspicion, and disapproval. Um, obviously, some aspects of the Democratic establishment are sounding a slightly different note on Gaza in recent weeks, in part for that reason. Um, so so they're, they're listening. It's having an effect. Um, obviously, the whole Democratic primary process has been so rigged in Biden's favor that um, you weren't able to work this out in, a, in an actual process where there's another candidate. Maybe there would have been a candidate who represented you know, what, the, what progressives want on Israel or other issues, and you could have worked it out that way. Instead, he's in this very untested position where he's maybe, or his surrogates, I don't know what he's thinking, are uh, perplexed or surprised by how much opposition there is to him on some of these policy issues. While at the same time, frankly, he is also opposed um, from a lot of you know, more moderate or just ordinary Democrats or normie people in general who think he's, again, the age issue still looming very large for a lot of the country. So 
here we are. Yeah, and then the second part of what AOC was talking about there, and I thought it was so interesting that she kind of shoehorned this in. It seems to be really a, uh, a kind of a, a personal issue and something that's really bothering her, understandably at this time, is all of the APAC money that has been pledged to defeat these candidates, these, I don't know if you want to call them progressive candidates, or just simply pro-ceasefire candidates, I think that's how she referred to them, who have gotten these challenges precisely because they have been willing to advocate for Palestinian rights and interests in this moment. Um, there, the AP reported uh, recently that the, more than 20 uh, progressive groups have come together to form a coalition to try to counter all of the tens of millions of dollars that APAC has pledged to spend against these candidates uh, before their elections. But this is a really interesting uh, moment where, because APAC has kind of ratcheted up its attack, it is now, I think, going to have to contend with the fact that public opinion is against them in a more obvious way than it's been in, in the past. So in past election cycles, let's say in the um, Nina Turner, Chantel uh, Brown uh, standoff in, I guess that was uh, 2020 and then again in 2022, um, APAC was heavily influential in the race against Nina Turner, who was a pro-Palestinian candidate, candidate back then. But the way that APAC uh, entered the race wasn't to say, hi, we're APAC and we're mad at, uh, at Nina Turner for her comments about Israel-Palestine, because the comments about Israel-Palestine are frankly pretty benign. Hey, I think Palestinians deserve to have rights. What they end up doing is, um, and I know this because my family lives in Cleveland and I saw a lot of this, these pamphlets and stuff firsthand, absolutely paper people's houses with flyers that, argue that Chantel Brown is the more progressive candidate than Nina Turner, um, that Nina Turner is secretly not against a $15 minimum wage because she voted against the Democratic um, Party uh, platform that year because it wasn't progressive enough, obviously not because she's against a $15 minimum wage, but really mischaracterizing her, arguing that Chantel was actually the more progressive candidate instead of arguing what they really want to argue, I would argue, is that she's the more um, pro-Israel candidate. Um, so what are they going to be able to still do that now when the issue of Israel and Gaza is really front of mind as opposed to something that is motivating different kinds of attacks? I will say, however, I think something that cuts against this a little bit is the most recent polling from Decision, Decision Desk HQ, which I mentioned earlier in the show, actually does have Biden up in Michigan over Trump right now. Uh, he's up three points from the last time this was polled 42% to 39%. Remember, there were some bad polls for Biden in Michigan about a month ago. Yeah. So this is interesting because obviously Michigan is one of the states because of its large Muslim population that is perceived as, I mean, it's a swing state already. It's a state uh, that Trump won in 2016, not in 2020, but in 2016. Um, so it, it, it was perceived that maybe because of the situation Biden's gotten himself into with progressive or Muslim voters in particular, uh, in particular Michigan would become a vulnerable state. But most recent polling says maybe that's not the case right now. I'm not sure what that necessarily reflects. Yeah, I mean, there's been reporting that Biden has really invested in Michigan for sure. Mm -hmm. I think those numbers were pretty scary, not to mention the numbers, again, coming from the uncommitted camp, where they aimed to get 10,000 votes and they got 100,000 uncommitted votes. The question is, as you raised earlier, what happens to those votes yeah. in the general election? And so I'm, I'm torn about this. Like I was saying, I, on one hand, I've been advocating for the left to advance this kind of policy, this, this kind of strategy for a while. And I think you have to credibly be willing to vote for Joe Biden for the threat to work, right? At the same time, do we want to be in a position where we're basically um, rolling over and, and neutering our ability to do this in the, in the future by going ahead and voting for Biden no matter what come the fall? So. Candidates like AOC, uh, politicians like AOC, who are kind of in a safe space right now in the primary season, able to say, this isn't hurting anybody, let's enjoy this. Are they going to change their tune when it's general election time? And are they going to still be saying those uncommitted people are right, they don't owe you their votes, you haven't shifted on this issue? Or are they going to start to say, you had your fun, you said your piece, you threw your little tantrum, but now it's time to come back into the fold and vote for Biden. That's what I'm interested to hear from AOC in a couple months from now. Mm. Stick around, more rising right after this.